You're watching the House of Jordan's video podcast on YouTube. Make sure you hit subscribe for more HOJ content coming your way. Now sit back and enjoy the show. Welcome to the House of George's podcast, episode 27 on the BenchClear Media Network. Be sure to check out the great BenchClear Media content at benchclear.us. My name is Chris. You can find me on Instagram at Chris underscore HOJ. You can find me on Twitter at House of Jordans. You can find us on YouTube at House of Jordans, not the House of YouTubes, the House of Jordans. And I'm here with... My name is Christina. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Christina's PC, K-R-I-S-T-I-N-A-S-P-C. And I'm Brian, and you can find me on Instagram at Joden Cards, J O E D I N Cards, and then Twitter at Joden Tweets. And also, we want to give a shout out to Nick, who is the video producer of this show. You can find him on Instagram and Twitter at Stiff Arm Wax, where he's showing off his football PC. Show preview for today. First up, we have the MJ Card Challenge, me against Brian. Yeah. For who found the better steal on a Michael Jordan card during MJ Mania. Then we have Christina's Corner, where we're going to talk about the forthcoming 2019-20 National Treasures release. And you're not going to believe what these cases are pre-selling for. Goodness. Then we have a brand new Michael Jordan card market analysis, looking at some of the most intriguing Michael Jordans that ended at auction this week. And our final topic is SGC, the... The grading company, SGC, on the rise. So, But first, before we get into those, let's very quickly do uh, another quick promo about our giveaway. Yes, we have a giveaway. Why? Where have you been? Um, we are doing a giveaway of a $500 box of 2018-19 Prism Cello. Yes, you might remember this was my quarantine box, my stay-at-home box that Christopher hid from me and I never found. And now it's being gifted to you. All you uh it has the box has silvers, greens, red, white, and blues, and of course bases. You have r- rookies of Luca, Trey, Michael Porter Jr., Aiton, and Bagley. Also have LeBron, Kobe, Giannis included in the box. It's so easy to enter. All you have to do is go to YouTube, subscribe subscribe to our YouTube channel, and leave a comment on any video on our channel. Easy. That's it. That's it. Once we hit 1,000 subscribers, we will be randomizing this box off to the pe- the person who fulfills both requirements. Yes, so really quick, a recap on the rules. All you have to do, you have to subscribe to our YouTube channel. You have to leave a comment on one of our videos. That's it. Subscribe to our channel. Leave a comment. One of those entrants, once we get to 1,000 subscribers, is going to get a 2018-19 Prism Cello box. All right. That's right. First topic, the Michael Jordan Challenge, which <laughs> Brian and I challenged each other to see if we could find a steal in the midst of this Michael Jordan market mania. So leading into the first episodes of The Last Dance documentary, and by the way, if you want to get our thoughts on that, we record an entire video, and we're recording videos every Sunday night immediately after we go live on YouTube, we give our thoughts about The Last Dance documentary. So this Sunday, every Sunday that it comes out, we're doing that. So if you want our thoughts on that, that's a separate thing. And it was So make fun. sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and set your notifications so you know when we go live. Absolutely. Now, this challenge, it was no easy task. Because in no. the week leading up to the last dance documentary, everything across the board, everything was just going nuts right. in terms of prices. So. But we had faith that there were steals still to be had. That there, yeah. and there, we even ran across some of the same ones ourselves. <laughs> we were kind of withering down to which cars we were going to choose. We sure did, and and so you know we looked. You know, there's options. You got 90s cards to look at. You got. 80s cards to look at you got inserts do you choose a base card do you choose a parallel lots of different choices to 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 start from and sort of narrow in and so you know obviously the thing here is to pick a steal and the question is how do you know it's a steal you know how do we know yeah. that we actually bought it at a good price considering michael jordan card mania is going on right now and the answer is simply if it was a steal then that means we should be able to sell it for more right, right? that means we would have bought it at below the market yep. and if we were to turn around and sell it we should be able to get more money for it. That would make it a steal. So we each picked a card, but before we reveal the card, 
what were your strategies? Okay, because we like we really kind of started looking in earnest like the weekend before. Yeah, the weekend of the last dance documentary. So, what were your strategies looking through eBay to try and find a steal? Well, I was looking originally for something of a, a pretty high grade because I was thinking that would be a good way to go about looking for steals. But a lot of those cards were going for a lot of money, so it wasn't necessarily the a a good option or opportunity that I could find for that. But I decided to go with something more in the lines of something I thought would be popular and something that lots of people um, want to attain. Um, So that was kind of my strategy uh, towards what I was kind of thinking and something that doesn't necessarily have like a whole lot of a huge population, but yeah, that's, that's a really great, you know, uh, approach like mine was similar. I just I went to eBay. I filtered to everything that was you know for sale, bin or best offer between two hundred and thousand mm-hmm. dollars. I thought that's like a nice little sweet range. Yep. And then I just started looking for stuff that you know using my experience in the Michael Jordan market that felt like maybe was underpriced. Yep. And you were doing something similar, and we stumbled across some of the same exact cards. Yep. We both stumbled across, for example, a raw card review. 9.5 of warp speed yep um which was listed on ebay at the time that i was looking at it it was 7.99 obo mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. i made an offer of 600 it was rejected then i offered 650 and it was rejected and then the seller sent me a message and he said hey i didn't realize this card is only a pop 18 uh sorry that i didn't accept your offer and by the way now i want a thousand dollars for the card so he upped the price to a thousand dollars and so I was like, okay, well, I'm out. Yeah. Um, it, yeah. It, Even then, if it's worth that much, it's kind of like, uh, well, you just did that. I'm, I don't. I, it's like the principle. It I'm is like, a turn I'm, off. Yeah. That, you know, it, it is. And the card sold. <laughs> oh, of, <laughs> of course. course. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the PSA 10 sold uh, at auction yesterday mm-hmm. for uh, over $1,100. And the PSA 10 pop is like twice the BGS 9.5 pop, which was only 18. So I don't know. Maybe 1,000 was actually kind of close to the market value for a 9.5. I felt like that was too high. 600, I was in. Yeah. A thousand too high. Uh, so didn't pick that one, but we did ultimately each end up picking a card. So I'll reveal the one that I picked first. Uh, the card that I picked is the 95 96 Ultra Gold Medallion Michael Jordan. I picked this card because uh, on the one hand, and of course this is going to happen, I just really like this card. Yeah. Um, so, you know, maybe there were better steals out there, but like when I see a card at a good price that, that I also like a lot, yeah. that puts puts me over the edge you it know, does but it also makes it a hard card to do this challenge for because you're very hard selling it so <laughs> very very hard so i paid 800 dollars for it i bought it on monday april 13th and yeah like i said it's it's a it's the first gold medallion of michael jordan comes from a great product i always loved ultra and bgs 95 the population on this card is 10 yeah so um i've actually owned one of the other nine fives previously um, so I, I once owned it and I have one of the other nine fives here temporarily. Uh, and then when I, so I, like I said, I paid $800 for it. A PSA 10, two months ago had sold for a little bit more than $800. So that's not even the all time highest comp recorded. Now, of course, yeah. PSA does command a bit of a premium, but, um, the PSA pop is higher. And so I don't know. I felt like that was a pretty sweet spot, but we'll see. We'll see. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll be announcing shortly how we're going to, sell these cards but before we do that what did you pick brian well so i chose the 1996 tops chrome uh michael jordan and this grade is an 8.5 bgs 8.5 um it was graded a pretty long time ago i think when i checked it was 2013 um so a little bit of an older slab and uh i i believe it's a little undergraded just by appearance i think uh so that is a, a another reason why I picked it up and why I was able to get uh, a decent price for it. I paid three hundred twenty five for it, um, and you know this set's a pretty important set. It's the first you know set of Topps Chrome, um, Kobe Bryant rookie cards in it. Uh, the you refractor know, version of cards going crazy oh, right now. Yeah, right? the refractors are so sick too. So, um, but uh, yeah, it's a just a really cool card. I think a lot of people relate, you know, Prism to this. So. That's also another connection there I feel like you could find. so I agree. So what we're going to do, we're going to send both these cards to an auction house. Um, and then we will watch in eager anticipation and see how they perform. Then we'll report back and see if we found steals or if we overpaid or yeah. maybe we just and who won. And who won. 
So uh, in, if, you, if you're in the chat, if you're in the YouTube live chat or... You know, if you're watching the YouTube video in the comments, leave your opinion on which card you think is going to perform better. Cast your vote. Put some skin <laughs> in the game along with us, and let's see which card will perform better. We'll have a popularity contest. Yes, and so yeah. we'll we'll measure it on two dimensions. We'll see which card has a bigger percentage gain, and then we'll see which card has a bigger absolute dollar gain. Yeah. And I'll be measuring how many listeners like which card better. There we go. There we go. Okay, yeah. so... We are proud to announce that Fanatics is sponsoring the BenchClear Media Network. All you need to do is visit benchclear.us slash fanatics. That's benchclear.us slash fanatics. You will get 20% off your entire purchase. 20% off. 20%? Now, this is a win-win because you get a nice discount at Fanatics, and the BenchClear Media Network will get a small commission. Now, you can buy at Fanatics sports cards, sports apparel. I was just on the site earlier today, and I saw an awesome Luca Nike City Edition t-shirt. Ooh. That you bought for me? For $26. That you bought for me? Using the bench clear discount. That's, wow. that's like basement level. That's One more time. Did you cheap. buy it for me? So all you have to do <laughs> is visit benchclear.us slash fanatics. Benchclear.us slash fanatics. And you will get 20% off your entire purchase at Fanatics. Okay, up next, we have Christina's Corner. 2019-20 National Treasures Basketball is finally coming out. It is. It is. So welcome to Christina's Corner. Uh, Before I go on to that, I just want to also shout out that this episode will release on Friday or Saturday, depending on if you're listening or watching on YouTube. On Thursday, I released an interview of the first of its kind, a Christina's Corner exclusive with Blake Jameson of the Project Project 2020 of Tops. Uh, he's one of the amazing artists that is putting together 20 different cards for the Tops Project 2020. And I spoke about that last episode. So Blake uh, actually made my dreams come true. In episode 26, I said I wanted to interview uh, some of the artists. He messaged me and was like, let's go. So that is dropping on Thursday or has already dropped on Thursday. Uh, Go check it out on YouTube. Uh, Okay, so back to Christina's Corner this episode. 2019-20 National Treasures Basketball. The pre-pandemic original release date was April 15th, 2020. The scheduled release date, according to Cardboard Connection, is May 13th, 2020, which is a Wednesday. David Adams does not list a release date on its pre-sale website. So let's get into the box, shall we? The configuration is 10 cards per pack, one pack per box, four four boxes per case. The box break average is eight autographs or memorabilia cards, one base or parallel, and one printing plate per box first off the line box break average is one rpa stars and stripes blue no word yet uh that i could find on what those numbers will be out of uh seven auto or memorabilia cards one base or parallel and one printing plate in the first off the line box key rookies include zion jaw rj barrett did I say that wrong? No. Oh, he looked at me like, <laughs> okay. Uh, RJ Barrett, Cam Reddish, uh, Rui Hachimura, 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 mm. whatever. Yeah, you got it right. DeAndre Hunter, Darius Garland, Jarrett Culver, and PJ Washington. Suggested retail price per Panini. Which doesn't mean anything. Is $700 per box. <laughs> hmm. Sounds familiar, but <laughs> there must be. A I'm catch. buying all of them at seven hundred. The bucks. pre-sale yeah. prices for a case on Dave and Adams is Brian. Do you have a guess? Mm, maybe let's go four thousand. <laughs> wait for a case. For a case. Sorry, I was doing per box. So it'd be that'd be sixteen thousand if. I'm doing the math, but yes. Well, uh, the presale price is fifteen thousand, so you were very close. Wow! On David Adams, there are currently three cases on eBay. One sits at twenty k with thirty one watchers, sixteen k at thirty two watchers, and the last is at fifteen k twenty two watchers. Half a case on eBay. There are two listed: one at eleven k and the other at eight k. 
for two boxes of a case. Uh, and then a box, there's one listed on eBay, no presale, one box on Dave and Adams, is 5,000 OBO for a singular box of this year's break. This uh, product this is going to hit hard because yeah. there's been a drought of product with the exception of Mosaic, which is sort of like filtering its way through the North American content right, continent right now. Other than that, this National Treasure is just going to be carrying a huge wave of basketball card ripping, itch needing to be scratched, and we're not ripping any of it at those no. prices. Oh no. my goodness, that's, ins- and that's unbelievable I mean, prices, but the, it's based on the 2018-19 box values. Right. That's right. how this market has been established from the very start. Yep. If they look at the 2018-19 products... And people pretty much say, well, you know, that class has Luca and Trey. This class has Zion and Ja. It should be the same value. And that's been said. So that doesn't leave but, a lot of room for growth. But, you know, we say that and then next year, these will be selling on the secondhand market for $30,000. Those okay, weren't right. the prices, though, last year at No, they're the prices now. Yeah, but that's the price now. Yeah. Which is why it doesn't really make sense to me. Because, first off, we've only seen Zion for like two months play. And then we've only seen Ja for like three quarters of a season. Like, therefore, it should be three quarters and two months worth of Luca and Trey prices of last year. It should not be what Luca and Trey, after a season and a half or a season and three quarters, are worth. Well, people are buying like people are buying Luca and Trey on potential for I know. sure. I mean, I they're know just, they are. but they're it, definitely the comp, buying Zion. Right? It's like but, this is the comp that we have, yeah. and yep. that's what the market just gets yeah. established at. I agree, it's though. Crazy. It is we, it is strange, and it's it's also strange considering you know we were able to buy a lot of this product last year for the price that Panini just you know put out for it, and then you could get it off the second hand market from eBay and stuff like that. Right. But, I mean, I got an entire case of. 1819 national treasures for less than what one box is currently selling at or pre selling <laughs> at. Yeah. Like, think about that. Like, I, I got a case. Yeah. Like, that's crazy to me. But, I got a case but, and a first off the line box for less than one box of 1920 national treasures. Yeah. What if so for so let's let's say you held that box for like a month and then you sold it. What would the price be then? What would your like flip be if you would have done that? Do you know? For the the 1920 or the 18, for the 19? no for the 18 18, 18, 19, 18 19, 19 didn't pick up steam like that no until, not until later until November really when Luca averaged or triple double 32 points 11 rebounds and 10 assists for the entire month of November and he won Western Conference Player of the Month by the time November was over all these prizes had just were well on their way to the moon and then in the first week of December the Mavericks beat the Lakers at the Staples Center yep. by double digits yep. and at that point in time Luca it was over. Mania yeah, aka yeah, yeah. Luforia yeah. great episode by the way for new listeners of the House of Jordan's podcast yeah. you're not going to be able to find it on YouTube but go to our Apple podcast listen to episode 13 Luforia it's our most popular episode we talk about Luca we talk about the that entire moment in time that was happening yep. in November of 2019 we break it down while so, ha- like live yeah, and now, you know, Luca prices are going back up again, too, in yeah. a lot of different segments of his particular card market. We're not yep. going to go into depth on that now, but... No, but needless to say, if you are interested in 2019-20 National Treasures Basketball, uh, good luck and God bless. You're on your own. Well, you know... <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not touching that thing. Well, ultimately, box values are, to some extent, derived from the value of the contents inside, and... I've held the belief now for a long time that based on the logic of comps in our market, as you were rightly pointing out, Brian, Zion's RPA is going to sell what Luca sells for. Yeah. In fact, those first few raw ones might even go higher than what Luca raws go for because people are going to be banking on nine fives and PSA tens. Um, So that's always been the comp. And I remember when we did our episode with Josh from Cardboard Chronicles, we were talking, what's the first Zion RPA going to sell for? Is it going to, you know, is it going to break $50,000 or not? And, it was unfathomable at the time, but now we're looking at the value of these boxes and the, that the value of these preset value of boxes. It better break fifty thousand yeah, yeah. for fifteen yeah. grand a case. Indeed. Yeah. Okay. And that's just a David Adams without a release date. Thank you. Like, for imagine when it actually starts. The National Treasures Going. update You're in welcome. Christina's corner. We still right. have a little bit more content to get off. through here. Okay. on Episode twenty-seven. <laughs> I'm gonna remember this of the House of the Jordans. 
MJ card market analysis. I'm sorry, but I just couldn't wait to get to this. this is the real answer for why I'm scooting things along here. First, we have a quick update on last month's Michael Jordan card market report. Uh, the first market report that we publish. We saw some astonishing record highs in that auction. And it was pre-Last Dance Mania. In yeah. fact, it was the opposite. It was in the depths of economic fear. This is when the stock market was at its lowest point since 2016. The concern is always that items might not get paid for, especially in a situation like that. So like, even as we were constructing this market report, I was very cognizant of like, okay, but we need to go back. We need to check. We need to make sure these items actually got paid for. And fortunately, PWCC, which we sort of organize these market reports around the monthly PWCC auction, which lists hundreds of Michael Jordan cards each month, and it provides a really interesting way to have a control certain variables over time by using the same seller. Uh, fortunately, PWCC is the only eBay seller that I'm aware of that documents all of its auctions and allows you to search to determine whether or not an item was paid for. And so if you ever wanted to do that, here's how you do it. You just go to PWCC's website, pwccmarketplace.com. You click on investors. You click on PWCC auction archive. You filter to auction. Do you, you filter within that box to the auction in question that you want to look at. And then you search whatever item you're looking for. And if the item was paid, it will show up and it gets saved into this database. And if it wasn't paid, then it gets removed from the database. And so I checked the 23 cards that we looked at last month. And guess what? They all got paid. Even the ones like the 98 Finest Refractor, which sold for like four and a half, three and a half to four and a half times what it had sold for three months earlier. Yeah. They all got paid. Okay. So with that update out of the way, second, here's a quick update on the two specialized market reports that we put out just two weeks ago. We gave these out for free to anybody who bought the first one. Um, We were so overwhelmed and grateful for the support that we got from the first market report that we gave a little token of gratitude. Uh, now, these reports were very thorough, okay? It, we, and they focused on just two cards. Mm-hmm. One report, well, t- two reports for two different cards. So these reports were like, they were very thorough. We gave you the entire eBay auction history of each card all the way back to 2004. We gave you graphical representations of the sales data. We gave you several pages of market analysis. We told you about the history of these sets. We calculated the expected value of the boxes. We gave you pop reports. There was lots of good information in there. And it, but really, at the end of the day, it's just stuff that somebody has to just sit down for a few hours and put together. And so we did that for you all. Now, we studied two cards. Like I said, each one had its own report. The two cards were 1989 Hoops PSA 10, which was the first year of that product. We looked at the Michael Jordan base card from that set, number 200. And then we looked at the 1990 Skybox PSA 10, which was also the first year of Skybox and the Michael Jordan base card there with him golfing on the back. Interesting card. When we published those reports two weeks ago, the market were the market prices were as follows. For hoops, the last sale reported was ninety-four dollars. And for Skybox, the last sale reported was ninety-seven dollars. Now, as of today, here are the market values for those two cards. For hoops, it's between 130 and 150. So that card's up about 50% over the past two weeks. And there are some outliers in the two hundred plus dollar range. Skybox now sells for two hundred and fifty to three hundred dollars. It's up about 180% with some outliers in the $350 plus range. So both cards have had strong performances over the past two weeks, especially for high pop cards, which is covered. Why do you think that the Skybox, because they were both in the upper 90s when we published these reports, and now the Skybox pulled way ahead. Why do you think the Skybox has outperformed the hoops? Personally, I think it's because of the aesthetics. Um as much as the hoops has like a, a cool look to it and it's got some style, um, I just think that the Skybox is a much more aesthetically pleasing card. It was lower pop as well. The pop is like a fourth of the hoops pop, okay. and they're both very difficult to gem. Yeah, but 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 there's no shortage of them in the market now. Um, so, and what do you think the future of this card holds throughout the duration of the Last Dance documentary and then afterwards? You know, it's hard to say, you know, because if it's a high pop card, it makes me think that people would want to maybe hold it if they're because I don't know why else you would be buying a card like this unless you were planning on holding it. Because to me, like, it's not a card that I would necessarily buy to really try to invest in, even though, like, obviously, if you you would have, you would have made some money. But that's with a lot of these cards because MJ's have just been going nuts, mm-hmm. you know, but. I just don't know if uh, in the long run, like, is this card going to be a thousand dollars? I I doubt it, uh, just because it's a high pop card. But you know, there is a possibility of anything. But I just 
I think there's a lot of probably raw copies too that are still available and people might chase that or people might chase the PSA nine or something like that. But like you said, these cards are both pretty hard to gem. I feel like they are tough to gem. Well, you know, on that episode where we discussed these cards, we showed off that Christina and I each have a PSA nine copy yep. of each of the cards. And that's good enough for me. Um, yeah. I, I'm not bullish on the long-term potential for these cards. Um, I do think that they are really interesting and they have some historic import to them. Yes. Uh, being, you know, PSA 10s um, of the first year of Hoops and Skybox, that's really cool. Yeah. And it's, you, you couldn't go wrong having a card like that in your collection and enjoying it. No, I mean, you, you, I know you've always really liked that card. The yeah, Skybox in particular. Yeah, I, I've always um, thought the design was way ahead of its time. Yeah. Sort of a precursor to what we would see in the 90s. Yeah. Beautiful card. But, you know, these market prices are very, very strong for, you know, cards that are super high population relative to the Michael Jordan market. Uh, but with that said, you know, we are in an unprecedented moment in the Michael Jordan card market. And we are, yeah. I, w- I mean, you wouldn't even per- want to hazard a guess, to be honest, about where this stuff is going. Because yeah, well, I mean, because you take it, you compare it to the modern prism pops and stuff like that, and it's just like it's not that far off. No, you it's know? not. If, off the top of my head, I think the hoops PSA ten pop was two thousand, and the skybox PSA ten pop was around like five hundred or six hundred. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You compare that to modern prism pops, and it's, it's pretty low. See, yeah, right. Pretty low, at least compared to the rookies. Right, that get greater. Okay. Finally, there is a brand new Michael Jordan card market report available, and we're going to go over just two sections of it here. But here's the point. You really need to have this report in hand, and you need to study it for yourself. Now, we've taken the time to organize all the data. We do provide some analysis on it, but you will see things in the data that other people don't see, that we don't see. The value of this report is truly in the fact that useful information is organized into a digestible presentation. That's it. We just did the legwork of collecting all this data from eBay and presenting it. Our audience is some of the most sophisticated Michael Jordan collectors in the world. They tune in every week. They will be able to make even better use of this data than we can. So here's how you can get your hands on it the same way as always. Just send $10 via PayPal to the address mjcardmarketwatch at gmail.com. MJ is in Michael Jordan mjcardmarketwatch at gmail.com send ten dollars via paypal or if you want to make sure you know that i'm around so you can get it right away as soon as you send the money reach out to me on instagram chris underscore soj on twitter house of jordans just or fire off an email whatever whatever way you're most comfortable with but you'll get the report very quickly of course you can always feel comfortable just to send the paypal i'll see it and i'll send it just make sure to tell me your email address in the note Okay, so just like last month, we have studied 23 of the most interesting Michael Jordan cards that sold in the April PWCC auction, auction number four. And here's the big picture result. This 23-card index on the whole is up 109% when comparing each card to its previous sale at auction. So if you sum up the previous auction prices for all 23 cards, it's a market value of $31,000. If you sum up the current auction prices for all 23 cards, it yields a market value of $65,000. Now, we assembled these findings into a seven-sheet Excel spreadsheet. You get a beautiful cover sheet (laughs) with the collage of the 23 cards. You get an analysis sheet with some of our interpretations. You get four different graphs that represent the performance of the overall 23-card index, as well as some of the top-performing cards. But most importantly, you get a table that ranks the top 23 performing cards, but the table does so much more. You see the date and the price of the previous auction of the card provided right there, neat for you to look at. You see the date and the price that it sold for in the PWCC auction. You see the population report. You get to see the ROI of the card, just the basic raw ROI. You get to see the feedback score of the three highest bidders on each card, which is honestly one of the most interesting, unexpectedly interesting parts of this report because inevitably there's always some big buyer that's buying up a, a bunch of the cards that's on this list. So like this week, the same eBay account acquired six of the 23 cards studied, and he was the third highest bidder on two more. So he was trying to just grab the whole lot of them. There's other repeat winners as well. Now, the hottest cards in our ranking system, it's interesting, they tend to garner attention from a smaller group of bidders, and you'll see them. The same people are bidding on the hotter cards. The lower ranking cards do not see as many overlapping bidders. There's lots of interesting things you can see when you just have this data laid out for you. It's worth looking at. It's worth thinking about. Now, perhaps the most important part of the table is how we rank the cards. And we have two special metrics that we developed 
that help tell the story of this auction and of all auctions that we study. The first one is the daily percentage change, and the second one is the daily dollar change. Now, what do these metrics teach us? Well, the daily percentage change is a way to capture which cards are increasing in value the fastest, because looking at ROI alone doesn't tell you the whole story. A card with a 500% ROI over one year is very different than 500% ROI over five years. So the daily percentage change takes the ROI, but it divides it by the number of days between sales. And so this puts all the cards on an even footing. So here we have the top five fastest increasing cards in terms of ROI. Number one, you will not believe this. Number one is the 1994 Flair PSA 10 Michael Jordan base cards. Wow. Is the fastest gaining card of all 23 cards. And I studied more, but I trim it to 23. Right. This was the fastest performing in terms of ROI growth. The 94 Flare PSA 10. Number two is the 1994 Finest Refractor with Coating PSA 9. Nice for that card to get a bump. It is. Because I mean, that card had been flat for years. Oh, yeah. And then in this auction, it ended up doing about 1500 It's a high pop card, though, for PSA 9. But with the actual coding on, I believe it's lower. Yeah. Yeah. And that the pop is, like, divided. So right. you really, when you're looking at the pop, you want to look at both. Right. Number three is the 1998 Metal Universe PSA 10 base card. Okay, so it's Chase the Base. Yeah. It's the invasion of the base. I made a post on Instagram about this, and I'll just briefly touch on it here. The logic of the Michael Jordan card market has been inverted. For a long time, when the Michael Jordan card market was primarily populated by 90s collectors, like us, basically, yeah. or people who started with 90s and people who collect Jordan, we all put inserts at the top of the pecking order yep. those cards sit atop the hierarchy we love the inserts we chase the inserts that was the logic of collecting in the 90s but modern card collectors don't care about inserts and for the most part with some exceptions inserts really don't get that much attention you know you have some you have like downtown you have kaboom you have color blast you have certain inserts that are in fact chase cards but for the vast majority of the time modern collectors are really interested in base cards and the parallels to the base cards well modern collectors suddenly became very interested in michael jordan cards and they brought the logic of modern collecting with them so now they come into the michael jordan car market and they're like oh these inserts are cool but where's the base cards at yeah where's prism oh you don't have prism what's like prism oh finest uh chrome Mm -hmm. metal universe these are the three big you know beautiful base card sets i mean metal universe is barely a base set though it is yeah. metal universe metal universe line. is an entire set of inserts yeah metal universe is like uh having a mistress if you're chasing base cards <laughs> metal, oh, yeah. you, you almost are cheating on the base card by going over to metal universe but you're not because it's still technically a base card Number four, moving on. Number four <laughs> is Natural Born Thrillers SGC 10 Gem Mint. SGC 10. Keep that in mind. We're going to be talking about SGC. Natural Born Thrillers. How about that card from 1995? You know, I, not a base card. It's an insert. Yep. And a beautiful insert. Oh, yeah. But still, it's, uh, you know, that's, that's never been one that you would necessarily expect to see on the top five fastest increasing cards. However... We did point out in an episode, oh, maybe a month, month and a half ago, that Natural Born Thrillers, Net Assets, and we had one other card, were cards that were flying under the radar. Yeah. And we need to remove Natural Born Thrillers from that list because it is no longer yeah. under the radar after it sold for, I believe it was over $3,000. Yeah. Number five is Apparitions. PSA 8. PSA 8. So this is PSA something we eight. touched on in the last episode. We'll touch on it again here briefly. PSA 8, the stuff that's a little bit cheaper, yep. a little bit lower grade, that's the stuff that's seen some of the best raw daily ROI percentage gains. Uh, it, last episode of all the Metal Universe 1997-98 base cards in any condition, raw or slab, it was the PSA 8 yep. that had the best ROI over 24 months. Yep. And then here we see Apparitions, which is a beautiful top insert from 98-99. Uh, PSA 8 is there you go. claiming spot number 5 in the top 5 fastest increasing cards in turn of ROI. And then we have the daily dollar change as a way to capture which cards are seeing the biggest dollar gains the fastest. And this is a similar thing. We're looking at the daily dollar change, not the raw dollar change because it's great if a card goes from $1,000 to $2,000, but it also matters how long it took. $1,000 over one year, it's very different gaining a thousand dollars in value over five years so here are the top five cards increasing the fastest absolute dollar gains 
Number one, 1986 Fleer sticker, PSA 10. It wasn't even close. The Fleer sticker, PSA 10, rookie Michael Jordan is just, it was head and shoulders. When you look at the market board, you're not even going to believe it. It was head and shoulders above everything else. The last sale was like $14,600, and this one was like $25,000, and they happened like a month apart. Whew. Yeah. And, and I think like the fact that there was no 1986 number 57 Fleer Michael Jordan rookie yep. base PSA 10 in this auction, like I think that really... It, yeah, it drove people that were going to you know put their money in that card. They put it into this instead. I think so. Number two, 1993 Finest Refractor SGC 10. SGC again. Um, we'll be we'll have more to say about this card later, but suffice it to say, the 1993 Finest Refractor. You know, now you're talking sort of. This is kind of like Prism Silver. You know, it's not surprising to see that the logic of modern collecting is once again dominating this list. Also, the logic of vintage collecting, because mm-hmm. we're seeing like the rookie card, the rookie sticker do really well. Rookie card collecting is is something that. You know, people who aren't traditionally hardcore Michael Jordan collectors, one of the first cards they're going to go for is a rookie card. And since all yeah. segments of the card market have started descending upon the Michael Jordan market, they're all bringing the logic of their collecting wisdom mm-hmm. with them. Yep. So vintage collectors who are dabbling in Michael Jordan right now, they're going to go straight for those vintage looking, you know, rookie. I mean, yeah, cards. and you have the stars, too. I know you didn't really mention them here, but those have been going pretty crazy as well. Oh, you yeah. know, they sure have. Yeah. The 84 star. Yeah. Many some, I don't know if it's a majority, people believe to some extent that's the true rookie card. Right. Uh, okay. But we not that debates for totally off yeah. topic, guys. Number three, natural born thrillers, again, SGC ten. So that's very impressive that natural born thrillers not only showed up in the ROI percentage change, but also in the raw dollar percent uh, in the raw dollar daily value change. So like it's performing exceptionally well in terms of just ROI percentage. It's keeping pace with those base cards. It had so much room for explosion. It kept pace with all of them. And it's keeping pace with the big boy cards that are seeing the huge absolute dollar gains too. So like if I had to give a sticker, a that's a cool card sticker, or you know, a card of the month, it would have to be Natural Born Thrillers yeah. because of this auction. Number four, 1994 Finest Refractor, PSA 9. And there's the other one. That card has now appeared on both lists as well. That card, it's a testament to it finally having its moment in the sun. It's a fascinating card. It shows Jordan in the 45 jersey. I've always loved the design of that card. It just takes me straight back to the 90s to look at it. And number five, the Topps East-West Refractor, MJ slash Kobe, because Kobe's on the back or front MJ's on the back, depending on which side of the country Kobe's you on the grew back. up on. Okay. Uh, BGS 10. And <laughs> BGS 10 is noteworthy. Um, that card grades pretty easily. And so there's, I don't, I don't recall off the top of my head what the BGS 10 pop is, but it's in the pop report um, or in the market report. And yeah, that, I mean, I think pretty obviously can see the appeal of a great late 90s insert refractor with oh, yeah. MJ and Kobe on it. Last segment, SGC on the rise. In that market report, you heard us mention SGC slabs several times. And what is up with that? Well, SGC is on the rise. Several gem mins, Michael Jordan set all-time highs in this auction, and they were in SGC slabs. So Natural Born Thrillers, SGC 10 gem mint, sold for over $3,000. That's an all-time high for this card in any slab. 97 Planet Metal SGC 10 Gem Mint sold for $3,600. This is an all-time high for this card in any slab. And the 93 Finest Refractor SGC 10 Gem Mint sold for nearly $9,000. That is an all-time high for any copy of this card at auction, but there is one sale that was higher. It was a BGS 9.5. It sold via Best Offer for $9,500, and that happened a few hours before the SGC 10 sold. All right, so... Maybe it's time See, to start taking attention to pay, maybe it's time to start paying attention to SGC. What can you tell us? What is SGC? Who are they? Well, that's a great question because it's kind of hard to figure out what SGC is an acronym for. You have to go back to an article from 2015 just to find out what actually is the full name of their company. At least I did. Maybe you are a little more tech savvy than I am. But SGC stands for Sports Card Guarantee Corporation. It was formed in 1998, and it's currently based in Boca Raton, Florida, which is why, yes, they're open. 
while everyone else is closed for business or only grading back orders uh, with one grader in at a time, SGC is at full capacity and they are open. For the first year of the company's life, they were headquartered in Bound Brook, New Jersey. And then they, like any good East Coaster, <laughs> made the trek down to Florida. Like Tom Brady and now Rob Gronkowski. Yeah. Yes. I loved that little Twitter, by the way. Shout out <laughs> to Tom and Gronk for filming that. Uh, if you haven't seen, go check out Tom's uh twitter feed because it's hilarious pretty funny yeah in 2015 sgc averaged according to this article ten thousand cards graded per month wow they had four full-time graders whereas psa who was also interviewed uh in this article had 13 full-time card graders so we could only imagine what they were averaging per month in 2015 um from their website, they say that customer satisfaction is at the heart of everything they do, and they are committed to strengthening the hobby and promoting the culture of collecting through superior service offerings and constant technological innovation. SGC customers enjoy an array of unique collector support and security features, including an interactive submission pro platform with order tracking, greater notes, a rich database of all items ever graded by SGC and more. One of the things they feature on their Twitter page, besides uh, pretty cool graphics in front uh, behind their cards uh, and some witty <laughs> posts, uh, they have constant updates of where your card is in the grading process. Received, grading, graded, shipping or verifying or whatever it's all tracked online so that's a really cool feature that they offer their customers that i was impressed with okay that's sgc they're open so how does the sgc grading scale work it's interesting and unusual they have two tens uh you can get an sgc 10 pristine or you can get the lower 10, which is Gem Mint. Now, we've seen two 10s before. Beckett has two 10s. They have right. the 10 Black Label and then the 10 Pristine. But uh, Beckett's use of subgrades sort of enables that because right. we can easily look at the subgrades to distinguish between them. But uh, SGC 10 Pristine versus Gem, you just have to rely on the word Pristine versus Gem to indicate what the difference is. But they're not the only company to have two 10s. But they have well, two tens. They do offer greater notes, so perhaps in the notes they verify or they justify why it's a pristine versus a gem. But then things get a little weirder. They have SGC nine point five Mint Plus. Mm -hmm. Now the description of what Mint Plus is: quote It is a card that at first glance appears to be gem mint, but upon close inspection may have tiny flaws that keep it from grading gem mint. So this is a very unique grade. PSA and BGS don't have a Mint Plus right. grade. So this is kind of like a PSA 9.5, which doesn't exist, right. or like a BGS 9.25, which also Nine and a quarter. doesn't <laughs> exist. So they kind of have, they're occupying this unique rung on the ladder of grading. And then they have SGC 9, which is Mint, and then everything starts to look familiar. They got 8.5, 8, five, eight all the way down to 1. Important to know. When you're looking at comps yeah. of SGC stuff. now. So, Chris, tell me, why is SGC emerging? Well, SGC stayed open during COVID-19. Well, what? Where did you hear that? BGS said PSA drastically limited their operations for a few weeks, so they're both, I think, practically up and running at full capacity again or somewhere near it. Well, I think technically they're not allowed to be full capacity I don't know. You California, check their social media accounts. There seems to be indications that they're back and operational uh now because of this little downturn though and because people didn't know how long it was going to last that definitely created the perception of sgc still being open and them having a long duration in the hobby um to back up their brand uh and you know their reputation vintage cards is established um more so than their modern reputation is or was uh, this immediately created the perception that SGC is a viable option for grading, um, and especially viable because they were the only ones who were grading stuff for a while there. 
Now, SGC also has been actively marketing the values of their cards they're selling on eBay. You can see that in their cool fire graphics on their social media accounts. And they're doing this, frankly, as a way to promote their grading services because, in my estimation, they must know that one avenue to get business is simply to be able to say, look, our slabs are competing with the values of PSA and BGS. And if they are, then that certainly would make them viable. Um, and if I was a consultant for a grading company that was trying to get off the ground and they said, what's the way that we could gain legitimacy and you know acceptance by collectors and hobbyists and investors and flippers and everybody else? Um, I would say the easiest way to do that is to you know have your slabs sell on the open market at the same value that the slabs of the competing companies do. And SGC was never too far off uh, to begin with, but now they are right there neck and neck with uh, PSA and BGS. And that little difference actually is a huge difference. Right. Um, now, what goes into people being willing to pay equivalent values for a third comp- a third grading company? I mean, you have to have rigorous grading standards. You have to be trusted. You know, There's a lot of stuff that goes into that, but... Um, really the way from a marketing perspective to to signal to collectors and and everybody else who's involved in this hobby that your services are worth utilizing is if on the open market your cards are getting the same values that the top grading companies are yeah and specifically having high grades too having you know sgc 10s like that's a you know it's not just like an eight or like an eight five that's being put up for auction necessarily these are very well, you know, standard for grades. And there's like, something to the number ten. Yeah, exactly. You know, when you perfect compare ten. It, yeah, compared to to a PSA ten, you just think, oh, it's the ten. Yeah, it's a ten. Yeah. You know, it's a ten. What do you think about how the slabs look? Uh, yeah, you know, that was interesting because I was going to bring that up. I think they look pretty sweet. I like the way they look in the. You've the owned black. a SGC slab on a few occasions. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and they it looks nice. I, I definitely think it has a different like appearance and style to it. I don't know if I like it more than a PSA or BGS, but it's something different for sure. I find it takes a minute for your eye to adjust to the slab. Yeah, because you're so used to just seeing the clear plastic that you're just like, wait, what? What? Wait, oh, okay. At least me. I'm like, is there a big black border around this card and it's like a random size? No, that's just the case. <laughs> I'm okay with it. Uh, I think the slab looks okay. Um, from the data analysis point of view, it's very frustrating to now have three yeah. different grading brands to track. And especially because SGC doesn't have a lot of historical data on these Jordan cards I've been selling. So like when I had to do the Mark report for some of these SGC records that were being set for these cards. I had to compare like SGC to PSA 10 previous stuff. And that's then you're really not exactly apples to apples, right. but like, and then you have SGC 10 pristine, which is different than SGC 10 gem. And uh, so it's it, complicated quick. It does. It, it adds to my workload, but <laughs> the, you know, on the other hand, what value does SGC add? And with the backlogs at PSA and BGS and like, Earlier this year, the PSA backlog was a million plus. It's probably even more now. Yeah, BGS backlog presumably got really bad because they terminated their guaranteed turnaround service time, which was very sad. So these car, these companies, these grading companies, PSA and BGS, are clearly overwhelmed. And so SGC can come along, and if they are indeed a viable third option, which they seem to be, and people seem to trust their grading, and they seem to like the way the slabs look, um, that can definitely help speed up turnaround times and that can help people get their cards graded more quickly. So last question of the show is SGC here to stay as a competitor to BGS and PSA. Oh, that rhymed. I think so. I think they've been here for a while. Um, I think they're going to be here to stay, but are they going to carry this new pristine, you know, this new, uh, level of, perception to them forever i don't know you know once bgs and psa open up again are you just going to see more people submitting cards to them opposed to sgc i don't know and then with when you add in the backlogs of bgs and psa like you have to think if i'm trying to flip my card or i just got a card and i want it graded i want it in hand yeah like if it's a big card and you bought it raw and you want to grade it to make sure it's authentic so that like and you have to get it in between 30 days so you could return it if it's not authentic, which I 
um, would never do. But I'm just like, you know, you would want to go to someone who can actually get it done in the time they say they can get it done, which unfortunately PSA and BGS are fortunately for their bottom line. Um, it cannot do. Yeah. I think when a company hits 22, like you're no longer worried that they're going bankrupt or that they're in their first five years of business and they're going to just go out. Um, I would be surprised if we don't see more grading companies start popping up, to be honest. Um, like I think the market is out there and if you can stick in for 20 years, you see that you will be a top dog. Um, but I think that collectors are hungry for it and they want something with like guaranteed fast turnaround, um, authenticity, uh, and just good looking slab. Yeah. A good looking slab. Very important. And a professional, like we will tell you where you are during the grading process. I I think that makes all the difference. It does. I mean, PSA and BGS do that too on some level, you know, you can log into your account and see it. If you're doing a group submission, you can't, yeah. you know, right. you're in the dark completely, but, or well, depending on who you sub with, I guess, uh, there are different levels of updating available, but all right, that will do it for SGC. And I have actually a final thought here. You do. To, Surprising. To kind of put a bow on this episode. It's a question. In fact. All right. We are going through, and it's, I think it's useful to step back for a second. We are going through a moment of MJ mania. Yeah, and we've been through Luforia, and we've been through you know longer term incremental increases in Jordan values, and we endured the PMG Green thing and how that kind of set the whole market on fire for a while. But we haven't seen anything like this in Michael Jordan. We haven't seen anything like this in the hobby, right? Ever, where all sports are suspended, all eyes are on Michael Jordan for the next four, three and a half weeks. Last Dance documentary. I mean, it's one of the most celebrated universally celebrated moments in sports culture that I can remember where it just feels like everybody's on the same team. Yep. Uh, all kind of rooting for the same thing here. And the market is going absolutely bananas. And of course it, that energy is eventually going to subside mm-hmm. and the documentary will eventually come to an end and things will go back to focusing on other news events and sporting events and God willing, live sports will return again. Right. So with that said, my philosophy on this is enjoy the ride. (laughs) Absorb. As as MJ collectors, you were not supposed to have this. (laughs) This is something special that, you know, you're you're collecting the greatest player of all time. Yeah. You're not also supposed to collect the greatest prospect of all time whose values are going three to five X over the period of a week. Right. Enjoy the ride. Recognize it for what it is. Okay? Recognize this moment for what it is. I don't have the crystal ball, the glass ball. I don't have the crystal ball. I don't know what's going to happen after this because this is such an unprecedented moment. I do think that it's realistic to expect that at least some of these values are going to retreat. We haven't seen any grails hit the market. Hopefully we will in the next PWCC auction. But I think those cards... Um, might not retreat to the same extent and rarer stuff and like stuff that's highly collectible uh, is probably going to not go up quite as dramatically and it's not going to be as susceptible to a downward fluctuation that very well could follow in the wake of the documentary's run okay now that's my take bottom line takeaway enjoy the ride just enjoy seeing the value of your michael jordan collection unrealized gains go up three, four or five times, uh, you know, enjoy the ride, uh, because it's not always going to be this way. Um, and we, we weren't even supposed to have this. Yeah. Oh, I mean, Rodgers. we'll be over at some point and, you know, the documentary is going to come, it's going to end. And like you said, it's going to be hopefully returned to normal. Right. You know, but what does that mean for the MJ market? I don't know. I'm pretty optimistic still about MJs because I think people are realizing who MJ is through this doc. And I think you're going to get a lot of people that weren't even fans of him from before that still want his cards. So I think you're going to get some people that are going to be holding these cards in their collections. And at the same time though, that demand is going to fall off once the doc is over because people just won't have it in their face every single day. But, um, you know, 
once I think, prices get set, it's yeah, it's hard to go back. Yeah, especially with MJ. Yeah. Um, I think that you have a lot of people. I mean, I've said it before. A lot of young fans who, like Brian said, are being introduced to prime MJ, not goat MJ, like past his prime MJ, like prime in play MJ, like game face. Mamba mentality, pre Mamba, <laughs> um, like, and I think that it, with every minute of every episode, you're creating at least two fans um, who are watching, and I, I'd argue a lot more. Than that, but <laughs> yeah. Maybe like two collectors. I don't know. Two yeah. two fans per minute, like oh per minute. Yeah. Per, I said per minute of the document. Okay. Yeah, per, oh, per minute. minute. Something yeah, many, per minute. Yeah. It's two hours. You know, 120 minutes. That's uh, 240 new fans created per Sunday night. Maybe you maybe multiply that by. It. Well, the the numbers new were fans. six million. Is it new fans? Right, that that yeah, you that watch, watch or like yeah. something. Six point one. That's 6. just 1. on ESPN. Oh, just on ESPN. <laughs> yeah, yeah number, that's like, not including the, the Netflix. Probably like a multiple, yeah. uh, and that was just that was, that was that just the live that okay. like the premiere that right, wasn't. They kept playing it over, and okay. it's on all the apps. You can watch it now. Uh, um, so okay. like, who cool. knows how yeah. many people? Uh, anyway, yeah. Um, like Chris said, enjoy the ride. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube. Me, uh, write a comment hit your notifications on youtube so that you know when we're going live and check us out on sunday nights uh youtube premiere uh of this episode is on saturday nights come hang out with us Sun- let me clean that up really quick oh, yeah please the podcast comes out Friday mornings on Apple Podcasts. Saturday night, we have the YouTube premiere of our show, which features the video visual enhancements. Sunday nights, for the duration of the Last Dance documentary, we are doing live streams only on YouTube immediately following the Last Dance documentary. And by the way, Nick, a.k.a. Stiff Arm Wax, is one of us talking heads in the Brady Bunch arrangement that we have going on. The Tom those. Brady Bunch. The- then... <laughs> During the week, also, we have clips from the previous episode uh, that are broken down for easy consumption and easy sharing. So feel free to share your favorite clip throughout the week uh, on Twitter. That'll do it. Thank you for listening. Uh, Enjoy the Last Dance documentary. Enjoy the ride.